The Amazing Spider-Man. For years, kids have loved his comic book adventures, but now he's made his TV debut in animation. Hi, I'm Stan Lee. I'm the publisher of Marvel Comics and the guy who dreamed Spidey up. How did our favorite web slinger make it to TV? You're about to find out. Come follow me behind the scenes in Hollywood, where we'll meet the artists, the actors, the writers, and the other wizards who all put Spider-Man on the move. Spider-Man on the move. We'll be right back. Now back to Spider-Man on the move. Amazing Fantasy number 15. I've got to have it. Fine, it's a thousand dollars. Oh, I, uh, I don't really need it. <laughs> wow. I never dreamed the first Spider-Man comic would become so valuable. And it's hard to believe that it's been 20 years since I first thought up the story of Spider-Man. Peter Parker was a pretty typical high school student. Until one day at a science demonstration, he was bitten by a radioactive spider. Now that accident gave Peter the power to climb walls. It also gave him tremendous spider strength. He vowed to fight crime as the amazing Spider-Man. And he became the most popular comic book hero in the world. The only trouble with comic books is they don't move. Until now. Welcome to Marvel Productions near Hollywood, California. This is where we're turning many of your favorite comic book heroes into animated TV shows. But before Spidey can move, we have to know where he's going. Now that takes writers to create the story. And the first step is a story conference. So in other words, he has to do something where, where Firestar is brought into the scheme because of her powers. Yeah. She's the only one in the world who can do something along with him. That's good. I like that. That's fine. There's a lot of give and take at a story conference. Don Glute and Christy Marks are two of our writers. They're suggesting storylines to Dennis Marks. Dennis is no relation to Christy, but he is story editor and producer for our latest television series. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Iceman and Firestar. How evil was he? I mean, is he like a Frankenstein? Does he create a monster or something like that? Television and comic books have one thing in common. They both depend on pictures to tell the story. Everyone at the story conference tries to come up with strong visual ideas. Fire monster. A fire monster. Huge. A huge monster is about, you know, 10 stories high. Bigger. 20 stories. That's, now I'm scared. 20 stories is frightening. And it stomps through the city and everywhere it steps, everything bursts into flame. Of course, any trouble our spider friends get into, they also have to get out of. If you write yourself a giant fire monster, you'd better be able to get rid of it. Using all these oh, stolen oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got an idea, an idea, an idea. Iceman freezes the Hudson River in columns. And on cue, they melt the ice columns and the water comes rushing in, engulfing the fire monster, and we see his fiery hand go down. As you can see, our writers can be real magicians when it comes to dreaming up stories. They keep the ideas coming, fast and furious. I got it. The goblin has a formula that'll turn everybody in New York into ugly little green goblins. My formula will make everyone ugly, grotesque, horrific. Like me! <laughs> I've got it. Craven brings dinosaur eggs back to New York, hatches them, grows them into a full-size army of dinosaurs, and uses them to take over the city.
something I've always wanted to do. Let's take some ordinary little schlemiel, some little schlump, give him all the powers in the universe, and then throw in some villain like Dr. Doom to manipulate him. He can do anything. I want new shoes and fancy clothes. And a gilded carriage with six black horses. And those nasty boys will be my foot servants. Spider friends. Spider friends. Go for it. Go for it. Most of our TV characters come right from the pages of Marvel Comics, but every once in a while we have to create someone new, as Dennis Marks explains. One of Spider-Man's amazing friends was supposed to be the Human Torch, but we were afraid if kids saw a fiery body, they might get the idea that it's all right to play with fire. So we changed the Human Torch into a brand new character. A beautiful woman called Firestar. A number of artists came up with ideas for what Firestar should look like, but Rick Hoberg designed the final version. Rick started out as a comic book artist. He says drawing for animation can be a little trickier. The design has to be simple and clean because there's hundreds and even thousands of drawings that go into even just one segment of, a, of an animated cartoon, and not one person will work on it, but maybe a thousand people will work on it. Rick has been one busy artist. Besides Firestar and the TV version of Iceman, he designed the evil Video Man, a sort of video game come to life. And that's not to mention Swarm, a super bad guy who's made entirely of living bees. Oh, good tune. Listen, I was going over Don Glute's Crime of World Century script about the dinosaurs. Larry Houston is one of our storyboard artists. It's Larry's job to take our written story and translate it into clear, interesting pictures that our animators can follow. Okay. All right. Thanks, Larry. Okay, man. people than just kids who watch cartoons. There are people like myself who, who enjoy watching this. They enjoy the escapism. They enjoy the adventure. And when you, when you adapt something and make it uh, just like the comic book, you can enjoy it. A finished storyboard is a lot like a comic book. And it gives us a chance to see how good our story looks all together or one last chance to change our minds. Now, this is when we hear from the president of Marvel Productions, that is, Mr. David DePatty. Well, I'm always concerned about these areas because it's like we don't pay proper attention to effects. You know, we're always concerned about the character animation. But in the David DePatty ought to know a thing or two about animation. After all, he helped create the yeah. Pink Panther. <laughs> David says there's a big difference between animating the Pink Panther and the amazing Spider-Man. In the case of the action-adventure characters like uh, Spider-Man or the Hulk or any of the other Marvel characters, a great deal more attention is paid to story. One more swing and I'll try it! Oh no you don't! You see, we really have to tell a story that has a beginning, a middle and an end something that makes sense uh, where with a character like the panther we're really more interested in fun when you work every day with such exotic make-believe characters they begin to seem very real the pink panther i've been drawing him for 15 years excuse me i have to go i like to be uh probably Spider-Man because he can do anything he wants to do. I'd like to be Iceman. It's nice uh, for the ice cubes you get, you know, and you eliminate. Captain America, because he's cute. I want to be Spider-Man, just like everybody else. Perhaps, due to my diabolical nature, Dr. Doom. Nobody but nobody messes with the Hulk. And besides, he's so savage. 
the mighty Thor, because uh, he's got a nice uh, way of doing things. I always dreamed about being a real super villain like the Green Goblin, a real weirdo. The difference between me and everybody else is I got the chance to do it. <laughs> I caught me a wall crawler! You're at the mercy of the real Green Goblin. And of course, you know, I don't have any mercy! <laughs> Where's my formula, web slinger? My formula will make everyone ugly, grotesque, horrific, like me! <laughs> very good, very good. Now come on in here and be a producer. <laughs> You'd better believe that Dennis Marks loves the chance to ham it up as the evil voice of the Green Goblin. Back in the recording booth, Dennis will work with director Alan Dinehart to make sure that every line of dialogue is recorded just right. And then we do 208, Spider Friends, go for it. Uh, okay. Okay. Hey, <clears throat> If you had a formula, what would you do to get everybody in New York to try it? Advertise on television? No. Actress Kathy Garver plays Firestar. Does she look familiar? She played Sissy on the TV show Family Affair. Iceman is played by actor Frank Welker. And Dan Gilvezan is the voice of the amazing Spider-Man. And Peter Parker, too, of course. There is a difference between the two voices. Peter Parker is a college student. He's very unsure of himself in a lot of ways, especially with girls and things, and, uh, which I can relate to very easily. And, uh, like, Peter might sound like, well, gee, we got to go over here sometime. It's a little bit sort of up in a higher register, a little, little bit different. When he becomes Spider-Man, he becomes a take-charge sort of guy, and it's closer to my real register, and it's more like, Spider-Friends! Spider-Friends! Go for it! we got to have more enthusiasm with the go for it! Every line of the script has a number. That's not only to help the actors to find their place. Later on, it will make it possible to splice the voices together. Director Alan Dinehart helps the actors deliver each line with just the right expression. Once again now. <laughs> Take two. If you had a formula, what would you do to get everybody in New York to try it? Advertise on television? No! You'd get people to breathe it, or eat it, or... Or drink it. He'll try to put it in the drinking water. I hate to say it, but the wall crawler's right. And the city reservoir is right here in the park, just a few blocks away. Spider friends, go for it! Very nice, very nice. We could use that. And May, don't! Uh, you've done enough work for today. We'll... Peter Parker's Aunt May is played by the first lady of cartoon voices, Miss June Foray. I play Aunt May in Spider-Man, but uh, you probably know me in quite a few other characters, like Hokey Smoke, Rocky the Flying Squirrel, and also Natasha on the same show, darling. And little Nell, um, who loves Dudley, but Dudley always loves his horse, unfortunately. And of course, all the uh, fairy godmothers and the fractured fairy tales and the little princesses. And don't forget scary, brash, impolite, and all around yucky. <laughs> In animation, the right sound effects are just as important as the right voices. Because recording tape is reusable, many of our sound effects come from our tape library. But an old pro like Joe Syracusa still likes to make some of his sounds the traditional way. By hand, and by foot, and by mouth. never know where you'll find the next great sound effect. This is Ms. Lion, the spider friend's pet dog. Her bark is supplied by Ms. Iceman Lion's himself, dog, like actor Frank Welker. Like we were trying to find a voice, we could have done a Beverly Hills watchdog sound, which is... It was a little too small. So we decided it is a female dog, and we wanted to get a sound, so we went with... Uh, Ruff, 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 ruff. 
Another one of our strange and unusual effects that we're using in our Spider-Man series is something that I found years ago when I was traveling with the Spike Jones Band in a deserted old warehouse at Wahlberg Auger's music store in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's something we're going to use for our swarm sound for our bees in our upcoming Spider-Man series. <laughs> Now we've got all the voices and the sound effects and the music recorded on reels of film, but they haven't been put together yet. But not to worry, we've come to the right place, the editing department at Marvel Productions. <laughs> Sound editors like Joe Syracusa complete much of their work before our animators draw a single picture. Joe has to carefully measure the length of every word and every beat of music. This is information the animators will need to make the pictures move to fit the sound. All that soundtrack information is written on timing sheets. Animation directors like Bob Richardson refer to timing sheets again and again, especially when it's time to match the words on the soundtrack with the motion of the character's lips. Every second of a motion picture is made up of 24 still pictures or frames. The animation director has to estimate how many drawings are needed to create the illusion of smooth, natural motion. Bob will do enough of these drawings himself so that other animators can complete the drawings that are needed in between. I think it goes through there pretty good and pretty smoothly. We have many different directors and animators working on our Spider-Man stories. That's why we need supervising director Don Jerwich to keep an eye on the whole operation. Among other things, Don makes sure that Spider-Man looks the same from story to story. The best way to check whether a character is moving the way it was planned is to do a pencil test. That is, to make a test animation of the unfinished pencil drawing. This gives us a black and white sneak preview of how the finished work will look. This one's where she comes around and the special effects painting on it will be beautiful. We'll have the oranges and, you know, all the fire. These black and white tests. I'm always excited to see the color test. Did you know there's such a thing as male paint and female paint? Well, take it from me. In Hollywood, anything is possible. What I mean is, the paint we use to color our female characters are a little bit pinker than the males. Now, I learned that here in Marvel's ink and paint department. Each of the animator's pencil drawings must be copied onto a clear plastic sheet called a cell. Artists select from hundreds of colors and shades of paint. Each jar has been carefully mixed and numbered so we can find the same shade each time we look for it. The clear cells are painted on the back. That way, any mistakes can be easily scraped off and corrected. Did you notice that only a part of the complete picture appears on each cell? Often, several layers of cells are combined to make one finished picture. That way, the animator must only draw the parts that are supposed to move, without having to redraw the entire background, too.
Here's where all our cells are combined with the right background, at the animation camera. Each cell has identical holes that fit onto precisely measured pegs on the camera table. That ensures that every picture is held in perfect position. Our animation camera is operated by John Burton. All we do is we follow all the director's and artist's instructions on the sequence of their drawings, how they're to be photographed, and in what order. What we're talking about in the still photography on motion picture film is the pictures I take one at a time when they're run through a projector at 24 frames a second, that's when it comes to life. The shot we chose to work on today was a relatively simple scene. But in the Spider-Man series, we do have some very complicated scenes where we stack multiple exposures one on the other. And you can get through a scene of, uh, say, 200 exposures, and you have to match frame all 200 of them five times with various special effects. You get into the fifth run, and you make a mistake. That means you go back to frame one and you start all over again. Much of the creative work we do is done right here near Hollywood, but there's so much work to do to make an animated show, we have to send it all over the place. Now, here in Utah, we do our storyboard layouts. Then, a lot of the animation is done here in Korea, after which we segue way across the globe to London, where we do our music. We then go back again very often to Japan for more animation. Whew! Then finally, we're back home to Los Angeles where we mix it all together. If you can make it to the tunnel, it's a clean getaway. Beautiful, I can hardly see. This is the audio mix, where the finished picture is combined with as many as ten different soundtracks. Each of these soundtracks contains voices, music, or sound effects. And if we're going to hear them all on TV, they must be combined at just the right volume. Let that ring off there's plenty there you know where the where the mm. cans are hit yeah let it continue on even after he sits up we'll just figure in the background that a can has fallen over the other way your windshield the war floor the weather pad just your friendly neighborhood spider-man turn there no there should wait a minute there's more just your friendly neighborhood <laughs> It's taken more than a hundred people over six weeks to transform our Spider-Man story from a written script into an animated cartoon. And at last, it's finished. Congratulations, just look what you've done. Congratulations, aren't you the clever ones? Congratulations, cause something new has begun. Cause Spider-Man's on his web and off the wall. Hey, we call this a rap party because we've just wrapped up the work on our first few episodes of Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Now, I want to say hi to some of my amazing friends, but don't go away. I want to talk a bit more with you, too. Spider-Man on the move. We'll now back to Spider-Man on the move. To tell the truth, when I first came to Los Angeles, I had no idea it would take so much work to make Spider-Man move. But Marvel Productions is an exciting place to work. Everywhere I look, I see writers and artists turning their daydreams into real TV shows. That's not so different from growing up, from learning the skills you need to make some of your own dreams come true. Thanks for joining me.